Uh, I'm going to talk also about networks and how we use networks to try to interpret the connection between genotype and phenotype. Um, I want to thank our translators. I, I know we have um, some interpreters here. If I'm going too fast, let me know because I tend to go too fast. Well, that'll be fine. All right, good. Um, I, I, anyway, thank you very much for being here. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a story, and this story is based on the idea of building models. And this is a quote we've probably all seen. It's from George Box. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And this is the crutch upon which I lean every day because referees are constantly asking me, well, how do you know the model's right? And my answer is, they're not right, but they inform our understanding of biological systems. So if you ask me if my model's right, the answer is no. There are absolutely elements of them that are wrong, but they give us things that we can interpret. So you know, my starting point for this is really thinking about data and genomic data. And this is all a cost curve you've seen, right? This is uh, the cost, estimated cost of sequencing the genome when the first genome was sequenced. It was $100 million. Um, you know, since I'm at Harvard University, that's clearly something I can afford, uh, but you know, <laughs> most mortals can't. Uh, the point I like to point to right here is in uh, 2009, the cost dropped to about $100,000. And I always used to say at that point, if um, I got there, uh, if my wife or son had a rare tumor, I would mortgage our house and sequence their genome. Today, it's about $1,000. And because of that, you know, I can pay for it on a credit card or a wash in genomic sequence data. The, the real question we have is how do we interpret it? And I think the challenge is that we as scientists have been overly reductionist. We tend to think about the individual genes or the individual elements that are um, influencing things like phenotype. And what we don't recognize is that we have this whole universe of other data we can draw upon. If I were to sequence your genome today, honestly, given the fact that um, it's unlikely too many people in this room have a highly penetrant Mendelian disorder, mostly what I can tell you is that based on your genome sequence, you should eat well, exercise, maintain a healthy weight, and not smoke. Right? And if you want to give me money for that advice, I'm more than happy to take it. But uh, you know, what we know today is really rather limited. And in my career, we started to think about things like defining phenotype from clinical records and combining with genomic data. But the, the thing we recognize is that there's this whole universe of da other data and information we can draw upon. And again, we, I think as scientists, fall into the trap of thinking about this overly in an overly reductionist manner um, because biology itself is not easy. And I like to point to one of the, what I think was one of the biggest failures of underestimating the complexity of biology, and that's IBM Watson applied to cancer care. This was actually a, a story that came out in Stat News, and IBM was selling Watson to something that was going to revolutionize cancer treatment. Um, and, you know, Watson became a household name based on winning Jeopardy. But when uh, people actually looked into how Watson was working, it was less like an artificial intelligence machine and more like the Mechanical Turk. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Mechanical Turk, but in the 1700s in Vienna, you could, get, you could go down to the public square and play chess against a robot, the Mechanical Turk. He was dressed in a sultan in fancy robes. And you would play this robot and you would lose. And so why did you lose? Did they have advanced computing that was somehow hidden? Was it aliens? No. It was a chess grandmaster sitting under the stage moving the pieces. And so, um, you know, this is what they saw when they looked in Watson. In fact, it was a group of oncologists <coughs> at Memorial Sloan Kettering who were uh, feeding advice into the system. And it really didn't work all that well. There's actually an XKCD cartoon about uh, Watson. Uh, you, know, you put in data from laboratory assays, and eventually you perform an autopsy. <laughs> so you know, it, it's a hard problem to try to solve. So as I started thinking about this, I actually had a student years ago who pointed me to a paper that was really influential in my thinking about how we approach this problem. And this is uh, the 1997 paper on no free lunch theorems for optimization from Wolpert and McCready. Um, and if you read the introduction, it, it sounds like an uh, indictment of every single machine learning paper I've read in the last 10 years. The past few decades have seen an increased interest in general purpose black box optimization algorithms 
that exploit limited knowledge concerning the optimization problem on which we're run, right? We take the linear algebra machine, we feed in data and truth comes out. That typically doesn't happen. So in this paper, they go through not machine learning, but these optimization algorithms, and they prove a number of what they call no free lunch theorems that demonstrate the danger of comparing algorithms by their performance on a small sample of problems, right? Sound familiar? But this is the thing that really caught my attention. The same results indicate the importance of incorporating problem-specific knowledge in the behavior of the algorithm. And for me, over the last uh, now almost 20 years, this has been the bread and butter of how we think about solving problems. How do we take a very complex system, develop computational tools where we incorporate biological constraints? So networks are a way for us of working in biological constraints. So the challenge is, as soon as I say networks, everybody has a different idea. Um, and Ben told me, you know, I would look askance at the last talk because uh, Hassan used Arachne. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with almost everybody's network uh, inference algorithms, including our own. Uh, I sometimes open talks like this by telling you how not to do network analysis, but I don't know who in here might be doing those things. So I decided not to do that and be much more friendly and tell you how we do it. And I just warn you, if you start working on networks or with networks, make sure you understand what people are representing and what they're using to infer that network. Okay? So I'm going to give you an example, and, and this sort of highlights the way we think about this problem. We have two phenotypes. I'm going to call them one and two. We're going to imagine they're differential, they're, these phenotypes represent differential expression phenotypes because they're differential phenotypes. If you really look, I just took this little heat map and rotated it, but they're different expression patterns. And then my assumption is that if genes are differentially expressed, there are different networks, or the networks that are regulating them are different. So I'm going to infer a network for phenotype 1. I'm going to infer a network for phenotype 2. Now, I've had people argue with me and say, well, the networks are the same. They should be a universal network. And then I would say, well, you know, what if you have a mutation and two proteins can interact or a transcription factor can't bind DNA? The network's different. Or if the edge weights are different, the network is different. So my assumption is if I have different phenotypes, I have different networks. And I want to learn those networks, and I want to compare them. I want to understand their topology and structure. I want to look at differences in their topologies, and we're getting increasingly sophisticated in the ways we do that. And then I'm going to combine differential expression and changes in topology to try to understand what the network itself is telling me. So this is kind of the basic paradigm. I'm going to talk about different methods for inferring networks. But the core ideas are that biological systems are driven by these complex networks. It's why things like Watson are hard to do. The structure of the network is important, and it forms our understanding of the system we're studying, and that there's no single right network. The network in each tissue, in each biological state, in you and in me, are different. And that helps explain our phenotype. And so the question going back to George Box is, does the model inform our understanding of the system we're trying to study? Right? Does it inform our understanding of biology? So we've been developing lots of different methods. Uh, we uh, started naming them after animals, and we've fallen into this trap now where there's actually in our Slack, um, it's a Slack discussion, there's a channel completely devoted to naming algorithms. And it's like naming hurricanes. We have a list of uh, uh, acronyms that people want to use, and they're developing methods, I think, now to fit the acronyms. Nevertheless, um, we have a group, and we call it the, the Network Zoo. Um, and in fact, uh, what we're trying to do with the Network Zoo is uh, integrate all of these algorithms together. So one of the people in my group is actually, uh, her boyfriend does video game design. And he's made a whole bunch of little animal <laughs> avatars for all of our algorithms. But we have Panda, which was the first, and then Spider and Puma and Condor and Linus and Alpaca. And we foray into cryptozoology and new monster and then Sambar, which is not only a tasty lentil dish, but also a deer. Um, we have Egret and a whole bunch of others coming along. And people often ask, well, why do you have all these different methods? And the answer is that when we get data sets, they typically have certain data types. And we build our algorithms depending on the data types we have available to us. We have kind of a framework we've been working toward in our thinking about how
we apply and use these different algorithms. And today I'm going to primarily talk about two, Panda and another algorithm that we call Condor. Um, and I'm going to touch on Linus, which is a really interesting extension of, of what we've done with Panda. I mentioned that uh, the network Zoo is now integrated in a really well put together package. Um, and uh, if you're interested, it's on GitHub. Marwen is really the, the primary developer. Tian is a software developer working with him. Uh, but he's really been pulling all these pieces together. And there are Python, MATLAB, and C implementations of almost everything. And it works together pretty seamlessly. So we have all these tools. What are we going to do with them? Well, I'm going to try to address a couple problems that we want to try to tackle. The first is, can we solve the GWAS puzzle? So GWAS is genome-wide association studies. It's a pretty well-known, widely applied method now that we have a complete genome sequence and have had for 20 years. Uh, we take individuals, we genotype them, so we get their SNP genotypes at each locus across the genome. And then we look at individuals in a control population, say in a disease population. And what we're looking for is an overrepresentation of a particular allele in that population. And then we draw an inference that that allele may, in fact, be associated with, in some way, uh, the phenotype that we're trying to understand. So in principle, it sounds like a really great idea. When the genome was sequenced, everyone said, we're going to find the basis of all genetic basis of all disease. And it turns out that outside of highly penetrant Mendelian disorders like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease, it's a challenge. So, I think about most diseases as being complex phenotypes. And uh, there's a consortium called Giant that really, I think, did a nice job of looking at this. They looked at another complex phenotype, which is human height, something that was recorded in a large number of publicly available GWAS studies. At the time they did this, they had 250,000 individuals, and they wanted to find the genetic um, determinants of height. And I always like to point out, I blame my parents for not being tall, because height definitely does have a genetic component. But as you know, there's no single tall gene. Um, and in fact, when they looked at the data, they could use about 700 SNPs to explain 20% of your height. To get to 21%, they needed about 2,000. To get to 24%, they needed about 4,000. To get to 29%, they needed just fewer than 10,000. Okay. This is a complex trait, like cardiovascular disease or diabetes, where you have lots of genetic variants, all of which have small effect sizes that are contributing to the phenotype. So what's the solution? Well, there are other studies that have found similar things. The same group looked at BMI and found something very similar. Um, this is a paper that addressed another challenge or another potential solution to the problem, which was rare variants. And um, this group looked at, I think, 111,000 people with type 2 diabetes. And they did whole genome sequencing on a subset. They did genome-wide uh, studies. And their conclusion was that large-scale sequencing does not support the idea that lower frequency variants play a major role in the predisposition of type 2 diabetes. And there's a little graph sort of illustrating um, their observed uh, data, the empirical data, versus a variety of different models. And basically, the rare variants don't explain very much. So we come back to this idea that phenotype or traits arise because of interactions between many genetic elements, all of which have small effect sizes. I think about this like Gulliver and the Lilliputians, where Gulliver is tied down by thousands of tiny ropes, each one of which he could break. But together, they influence um, his physical state. So a few years ago, we decided to tackle this problem. And we decided to look at the largest data sets we could find, where we can interpret mechanism and association. And that was data uh, for which, or those were data sets for which we had gene expression and genetic information. And we decided to look at expression quantitative trait locus analysis, or EQTLs. If you're not familiar with QTLs, QTLs were a method that was developed long ago. I first learned of them when they were applied to the medically important problem of tomato breeding, where people were breeding tomatoes and looking at genetic variants and trying to associate traits like the roundness and redness and ripeness, quantitative traits of fruit with genetic background. With EQTLs, this is an idea that developed now almost 20 years ago, 
we have 25,000 genes in the genome. We can get quantitative measures of their expression levels. We can take the SNPs at each locus in the genome, and we can simply ask, is there an association between genotype and gene expression? There's a wonderful package for doing this. It's called Matrix EQTL. It's very fast, very efficient. And you can look at this kind of simple linear model and collect the SNP gene association. So a particular SNP at this locus is clearly associated with the expression level of this gene. And we do it for all 25,000 SNPs together with all 6 million genes, and you get a series of associations. Now, if you look at those individually, it's hard to make sense of them. We decided to do the thing that everybody loves and hates to do, which is to represent them as a graph or a network. In this case, what we decided to do was to represent them as a bipartite graph. So in a bipartite graph, we have two types of nodes. We have SNPs and we have genes. And an edge simply means that there's a statistically significant association based on our EQTL analysis. So this gene, for example, is influenced by three SNPs, and this SNP influences two genes. And that's our basic model. Now, when we did this, one of the things we did was we decided to look not only at SNPs, which are immediately adjacent to the gene, so those that might fall into promoter regions, disrupt transcription factor binding. There's a growing body of evidence that SNPs far away from genes, transacting SNPs, may have a functional role. So we decided to look at all of this together. And our first application was actually published in PLOS Computational Biology a few years ago, where we looked at lung tissue from a large study. And we built EQTL networks in this large, relatively large lung um, tissue population. So in building these networks, what we did was we looked at our EQTLs. We looked at the SNPs genes, SNPs and genes. We represented them as a network. And then we stood back. And we said, well, what does the structure of this network tell us? So one of the first things you think about doing when you look at a network is to look at the degree distribution. And I apologize for the smudges up here, but if you focus on the black dots, this is a, the degree distribution. It's the plot of the log of the frequency versus the log of the degree. And the degree is simply the number of connections a given, in this case, SNP has to a set of genes. And this is the kind of distribution, some people call it a scale-free distribution. It's a linear log-log plot uh, because there's no characteristic scale. Actually, formally, it's a fat-tailed distribution because the tail gets fat down here. And it's close to scale-free, but not quite. But this is the kind of distribution you see in naturally evolving networks. So this is like the internet. Down here are the things we think of as the hubs, the Googles and Amazons and Ebays. Up here is your laptop, right? If Google shuts down, everybody freaks out. You close your laptop, nobody cares, except maybe your mom who can't see you on the internet anymore. <laughs> so we asked ourselves, if we look at this and ask, where do GWAS hits land? Where do they fall in this diagram? And you're going to see little red dots appear, and the sort of bad projection gives that away. But the question I always ask is, do you expect to see GWAS hits associated with pulmonary disease, lung disease, in the, the nodes, uh, in the leaves, or in the hubs. And it turns out when we look at the hubs, the hubs are absolutely a GWAS desert. So now you can see the red dots appear, more or less. So the hubs are a GWAS desert. And for us, that was a really interesting observation. Because we thought, well, maybe they're the things that are really disrupting the network. Um, a couple of us in our group argue over what the right answer is. I think the reason we don't see them in the hubs is partially they're fewer hubs. But partially, there's a selection bias. If you get a deleterious SNP in a place that's affecting a lot of the genes in the genome, you probably don't live to pass that on. So we started to ask ourselves, what does this mean? And you can sort of see it here. There's a slight over-representation in the middle. There's a slight under-representation of the leaves. There's nothing down here. And what that suggested to us was the network had some structure that we could try to interpret. So what we decided to do was to look at community structure in a network. And all networks, or many networks, have community structure, right? So I'm, I'm going to assume you have a mobile phone, which is probably a pretty good assumption. I'm going to assume you're married and have children, right? So you call your spouse. Your spouse calls your son. Your son calls uh, your daughter. Your daughter calls her grandmother. Your mother calls you, right? 
you have a family network, a family community, that's defined by the fact that on any given day, any two of you are more likely to call each other than you are to call some random person in the outside world, right? And after this presentation, since it's so brilliant, you'll probably call me, but the chance that your mom calls me is pretty close to zero, <laughs> right? So your family community is well-defined. In fact, if you look at telecommunications, you have family communities, they're the ones you call on holidays, you have work communities, they're the ones you call Monday through Thursday, you have social communities, people you actually like that you call on weekends and spend time with, right? And we all fall into these communities and the structure and membership in those communities is actually predictive of day of the week, or we would argue predictive of something relative to the function or uh, phenotypes that we're trying to observe. So we applied a modularity maximization method uh, in Condor, this method we developed. And now I'm going to represent a network not as a big hairball, which is hard to see, but in this representation, which is what we call an adjacency matrix. So this is our COPD data, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is an EQTL network in lung tissue. Every row is a gene. Every column is a SNP. And a dot means there's, a, uh, there's an association based on our EQTL analysis. And community detection is really a clustering method. And what you can see is they're very tight, highly modular communities. You can see the, the hubs, they're these vertical stripes. And you see a few of those, but the communities are really tight, very modular, and linked together. So we started to ask ourselves what's represented here. Now, I almost never draw hairballs, and I'll probably violate that multiple times, but this is a nice representation. John Plattick also drew a pseudo hairball. Uh, this is actually one of the displays in Cytoscape, and I think of it as, you know, Venus, Botticelli's Venus. Here's a clamshell opening up, a seashell, and beauty is coming out. Um, these are the same communities. I apologize some of the lines don't show up all that well, but... One of the interesting things you see is we've got communities that have a really rich structure and are linked together in interesting ways. There are 52 of them. There are a small subset that appear uh, disconnected from the rest. The other giant connected component is what we really focus on. The giant connected component has uh, a 34 communities and at least a third of them and actually many more, but at least a third are significantly overrepresented for genes that have common functions, right? And this is a really interesting observation because if we think about genetics, we tend to think about Mendel and his peas. We have a single gene building on a single trait or influencing a single trait. Here, I would argue we have groups of genetic variants, groups of SNPs, which are influencing, in this case, a function or a process in the cell. So it's a really interesting observation when you think about complex traits. I'm not tall because I have a bunch of SNPs which are preventing me, or enhancing my current height, uh, preventing me from being as tall as I would have liked to be, right? And they're all working together by influencing a process which is related to my height. One of the other things you see, though, if you look here, is that many of these communities have SNPs that are more highly connected. They're local hubs, and we started calling these cores and John Plattick, who is doing this work, developed a metric that we call core scores. And the core score is essentially the fraction of the modularity that we can link back to a single SNP, right? So if you go back to my example of a family, think about a big family that calls each other. Family might have a matriarch who keeps the family together, and if grandma dies, then the family falls apart into warring factions, right? In the same way, that grandma has a high contribution to the modularity of that family or its, uh, its uh, consistency, the communities have SNPs that are overly contributing to the modularity. It's what we call their core scores. So we took 34 GWAS SNPs, right? And the fact that they were GWAS SNPs never entered into this analysis. We mapped them back to the communities. It turns out that 33 of the 34 map to three communities, all of which have functions which are associated with COPD. But what's more interesting is when we looked at their core scores, the average core score for these SNPs was 20 times higher than the average core score in the network. Okay? What does that say? These SNPs are at the center of their community. They're the ones most likely to be contributing to influencing 
the biological process represented in that community, right? And the likelihood that we find a GWAS SNP is tied to how central it is to its community, how likely it is to perturb that function of that community. And that's a really interesting observation that comes out of the model that's not baked in. So you could ask me, well, can you go back and predict phenotype from these GWAS SNPs? Not yet, but we're working on methods to do it. We were curious how common this was. Um, so we decided to look at data from uh, the GTEC study, and we published an analysis of 13 different tissues uh, based on data from GTEx. Um, it's a really interesting story. We submitted the first paper to PNAS, and it was rejected without review. Um, we then took the second paper and submitted it to PNAS, and they said, well, you know, Another paper was already published on this, and if you had submitted your, that first paper here, we would have published it, but this is too late. And then I, I wrote back to them and said, well, by the way, here's the rejection letter you sent from the first paper where you didn't send it out for review. And so they took this and actually <laughs> reviewed it and published it, um, which made me very happy. It was one of the few times I felt like I got something over on an editor. Uh, but GTEx was a study that looked at the time, it's now released seven, so it's almost twice this number, but about 450 individuals, they were all genotyped. They sampled 53 different sites around the body and with 51 plus two tissues or two cell lines they made. And um, they did RNA-seq on all of those. So there's a whole bunch of pre-processing and analysis that went into it. We had 13 tissues in which we could build networks. This is just a plot of the modularity of the communities in these networks. They're very similar to what we saw. Um, I have an example here, which is heart left ventricle. And you can see it has the same kind of modular structure and community structure. Not exactly the same, but very similar to what we saw before. So this was encouraging. What's probably more interesting is if we look at the degree distribution. And so up here, there's the degree distribution. Now we have blue spots instead of red spots. I don't know if it's easier or harder to see. But Maud Fagney, who did this work, actually plotted the observed versus expected number of SNPs. And this is really clear, that there's sort of a, an increase in the middle, and then boom, there's nothing. And I think this is heart left ventricle. Um, we also have the core scores for GWAS SNPs and non-GWAS SNPs. This is true within tissue. This is true across all tissues, um, depending on how you choose the SNPs. The core score of GWAS-associated SNPs is significantly higher than the average core score in the network. And so now this is looking at all 13 tissues. This is the same plot we saw, and I just pulled out a characteristic example. In every single one, we see the same kind of drop-off at about degree 10. Is 10 magical? I don't think so, because it has to do with the complexity of the network and how much data we have. But there is some threshold above which GWAS-associated SNPs simply don't occur in any of these networks. And we've seen this multiple times. So the paper is really nice. Um, and really, it re reaffirmed the idea that in most instances, it's not a single SNP controlling a trait, but a family of SNPs that influence a process. The GWAS SNPs are at their center of communities, and they fall into communities where the biological function makes sense, given what we know about the process. The core SNPs are disease SNPs. The structure of the network is really informative. But the last piece of this, which is in that paper, is really fun. If you look at tissue-specific uh, networks, we find that in those networks, there are communities which are specific to those communities, and they carry out tissue-specific functions. And what's really cool is if you cross-reference those with SNPs from ENCODE, you find they fall into tissue-specific regions of open chromatin. Right? So you have SNPs that are not accessible except in a certain tissue. When they're accessible, they aggregate SNPs, into a, SNPs and genes into a new community that carries out tissue-specific function. So is this model right? Any individual SNP gene association? Probably not. But there's something in the big picture that I think is pointing us to truth. Okay? So I spent a lot of time with question one. Now I'm going to do question two. What about cancer? Well, having these EQTL networks, Maud Fagney, who was the first author on this paper, decided to go back in and to look for these common variants with low penetrance that we know are associated through GWAS studies with cancer risk. So you can find these in the GWAS catalog. If you look, most of these are non-coding SNPs. They're intergenic SNPs. 
uh, some of them are synonymous, very few of them are actually genetic variants that disrupt coding. So we asked about the non-coding SNPs. What do they do? Where, where do they actually fall and how do they influence disease? So we decided to look at a couple of different examples. One of the ones we highlight in the paper is skin. So we looked at the skin network. Again, it's very similar to the other networks we saw. And then we mapped cancer risk SNPs to these networks. And what we discovered in looking at them is that they fell into very specific communities and that, in fact, they were overrepresented in certain communities. Right? So we really want to understand what these overrepresented SNPs are doing and where they fall since they've been associated with cancer risk. So when we look at the communities into which they fall, we look at both skin cancer and breast cancer risk SNPs in skin. And what we find is that in these epithelial tissues, like skin, we find that cancer risk SNPs fall into processes associated with epithelial differentiation, which is not a surprise, cell division, which is not a surprise, and immunity, which is probably not a surprise. So the SNPs aren't randomly distributed across the genome. They fall into communities where the functions, again, given the fact this is cancer, make sense. The other thing which is really interesting, though, is that if we look at all the SNPs in the genome, almost the only SNPs we see associated with oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes are the cancer risk SNPs. Now, this may seem like circular logic, but the cancer risk SNPs were found through GWAS studies without referring to oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And our evidence, the evidence from this analysis suggests they are regulatory for those oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Again, maybe not surprising, right? You carry a, 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 a mutation in a gene like KRAS, but the other SNPs that regulate the expression of that gene actually play a big role in moderating your risk of developing cancer, right? So it's an interesting observation. The other thing, though, is that we see lots of biological functions that are associated with these cancer risk SNPs. So not, on, not only are they linked to controlling the oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, but they're associated with a variety of different processes that we link to the underlying etiology of the disease, like epithelial development. So this is just a nice example. I apologize, I'm going to skip to this slide because Ben's giving me the dirty eye about running late. <laughs> but this is one of the examples we pulled out in um, the paper. So this is a, a cancer risk SNP that you can find. Um, uh, PHGDH is a cancer gene in breast cancer. And it's um, associated very tightly in cysts with PHGDH, but these other genes are all genes associated with epithelial development that one could argue, based on this data, are also influenced in their expression levels by these genes. So it's a very interesting set of observations that give us insight into how risk for these diseases might be mediated by uh, cancer, or by um, these SNPs. So the regulatory SNPs do play a role in cancer. They affect the expression of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. They're more likely to affect genes associated with other relevant processes. And these bipartite EQTL networks can be used to characterize these regulatory SNPs associated with traits and disease. These two papers, there's a lot more information describing that. Uh, this paper was actually just accepted a couple weeks ago in the British Journal of Cancer. And last night, we submitted the, the proof. So hopefully, you'll be able to see it. But all our papers go on bioarchive as soon as we write them. So. This is there. It'll be in the British Journal of Cancer in a few days. Right. I have two more questions I want to go through. I have about 10 minutes. People can ask questions at the end. So I'm going to go through these two last examples in an interesting way. So can we model gene regulatory processes? Well, I told you we started with Panda. That was our first network model. It got us in the, this um, uh, domain of naming things after animals. Panda is actually an acronym, of course. And I know N is for networks. The rest of it I always forget. It's based on message passing, which since I'm in Toronto, I have to pay homage to Brendan Frey, who's here, who's one of the pioneers in developing message passing. But Panda was the first attempt we had to try to build what I think of as realistic models. It's based on the idea that we're going to measure RNA, but whether or not we get an RNA transcript depends on transcription factors that are essentially telling the cell's machinery to turn this gene off. 
So we're going to model this as a communications process where we have transcription factors sending a message to the gene, right? I'm going to tell you about this method. At the end of this lecture, I'm going to give you a quiz. How well you do on that quiz is going to depend on two things. It's going to depend on how well I explain the method, but it's also going to depend on how well you listen, right? I'll use the example when I come home at the end of the day, the minute I walk in the door, my wife starts telling me about her day. In the first five minutes, I hear nothing. When I first got married, I would, she would say, don't you remember? Or she would say, don't you remember when I told you? And I would say, you didn't tell me. And then I'd sleep on the couch for a few days. Now I just say, oh, I'm sorry. I should listen better. But I guarantee that she didn't tell me. Okay? I would never say that. And if you tell her, I'm going to be angry. But if we think about communications, there are actually two participants, a transmitter that's responsible for communicating the information and a receiver that has to be available to receive it. And if I try to estimate these functions without any other data, there's no way to really estimate and tell who's responsible. If you fail the quiz and someone wasn't in the room, they wouldn't know why. But if there are other individuals in the room who take the same quiz, right? if everybody fails, I did a bad job. If everybody passes but you, I did my job, everyone else did their jobs, and you're just a bitter disappointment to everyone. <laughs> so, where does the information break down? Or where's the flow of information break down? Well, what we do is we start with a guess as to where um, transcription factors might bind. So we use a motif scan. We can argue whether that's the best way to do it. I'm always open to better ways. Uh, we guess an initial network. We take data on protein-protein interactions and co-regulation of genes gene expression data, we update these functions, we update the network, and then we iterate the process until it converges, all right? So our first application of this was in ovarian cancer. We looked at two subtypes of ovarian cancer. This is a pretty dis uh, disreputable paper because of some of the authors who you might not trust, <laughs> but uh, it's a nice example of two subtypes of a disease that we could model. And what we did was essentially what I talked about earlier. We built two network models. I reused the heat maps. Two network models. I reused the, the diagrams, too. Um, and then what we did was we compared them and asked, how are these networks different? And this analysis was really important for me because what we did is we looked at the changes. And what we saw was the changes were really in the edges. And the way I think about networks now is the atom of the network is the set of connections, the edges that make your network different from mine. So this is a plot of what the network looks like. It's a plot that's hard to interpret. The 10 transcription factors with the greatest changes are around the middle. The genes around the outside are those that are regulated by those transcription factors. The little black ticks represent known angiogenic genes. But the key thing is that there are transcription factors, or there are genes that are regulated by a single transcription factor, and there are genes that are regulated by multiple transcription factors. If you look at this, what you discover is that many of those transcription factors which appear together are actually way overrepresented compared to what you'd expect by chance, and they're, they're transcription factors that are known to form complexes, and that, in fact, there's data that suggests if you disrupt these complexes, you develop disease, or you can uh, prevent the uh, development of the phenotype. So we've published a lot of papers using this method. Um, and one of my favorite is one looking at 38 different tissues and looking at differential patterns of regulation, asking what makes a tissue a tissue. But I'm not going to talk about that. What I want to talk about in the last four minutes it's something I get really excited about, as I've not been excited enough about everything so far. And this is the question, can we move beyond the network? And I want to pose this just as a way of thinking about problems. All right? So this is something we wrestle with all the time. When we estimate networks, we estimate them using a population. So I can take a blood sample from all of you, get gene expression data, and I can estimate the Torbug uh, gene regulatory network. But the problem is that's one network representing all the samples here in this room. It's an average. And so what we did was we developed a method we call Lioness that allows us to estimate individual sample networks. And it's based on a simple idea around linear interpolation. So I'm going to explain how this works. Okay? So I'm going to collect blood samples. I'm going to RNA-seq. I'm going to use Panda. I'm going to estimate the Tor bug Panda network. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that network and I'm going to take my population and I'm going to take Hassan out since he spoke before me. 
And I'm going to estimate a network for everyone but Hassan. Okay? So I have the network with him and the network without him. Then I'm going to compare those networks, realizing that if on average his regulatory connection is the same as everybody else's, removing him isn't going to change the network average. If his network is a little bit stronger, removing him is going to reduce that estimate. If his network is a little, little weaker, then removing him is going to increase the estimate. So if I take the difference between them, I actually get an estimate of how different he is from the n minus 1 network. So if I scale that and add it back to the n minus 1 network, I can estimate his network. Now I put Hassan back in, I take Ben out, do the same thing, and I do it for each and every one of you. Now instead of having one network, I have 75 networks. And if I have 75 networks, I can start to do statistical tests. So the Linus equation, as we call it, is really simple. Subtract networks, add them back together. Um, and it's a pretty simple uh, procedure. So we tested this as all good methods are tested on the Paul Spellman yeast cell cycle data. We estimated two networks for each one of the individual time courses. We know the gene expression is correlated, but if we take the edge weights in the individual networks, we find the edge weights are also correlated, which is pretty cool. If we take the edge weights that are most variable, and this is what I really like, what you see is an oscillating pattern. And remember, this is Spellman's cell cycle data, so you expect to see oscillations in gene expression. But our estimates of the oscillation of the regulatory processes is also uh, periodic. And what's really cool is we can plot the edge weights in black and the expression levels in red. And this is for Panda modeling regulatory processes applied to this with individual uh, networks at each time point, we can ask, look at the estimates of the edge weights. And what you can see, and each one of these transcription factors is known to control the cell cycle, what you can see is an oscillation. And when we first saw this, I got really excited. Then I got really disappointed because you'll notice that the edge weights are oscillating with twice the frequency of the gene expression levels. Then I remembered this is message passing, and what we're really seeing is turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off, turn off. What I should have expected going into this, and that's what we see here. And we do better jobs of predicting transcription factors. The last thing I want to do, is, though, is just tell you how we've applied this. So this is work that Marike Kucher has done. She's now at University of Oslo. We're still trying to write up this paper. Uh, but we looked at two subsets of glioblastoma patients. We define good and poor prognosis, even though glioblastoma is mostly poor, depending on how long people live, greater than or less than about a year and a half. We built networks for each one of the 525 individuals, and we asked, are the edge weights correlated with things like survival or representation in these two groups? We found 148 edge weights that are significant, and then we looked at what those edges do. And it turns out that what a lot of the edges do is regulate immune processes, right? Which, again, may not be surprising. But if you have differences in survival that are correlated with differences in the regulation of immune processes, you might imagine that this is a way of thinking about how we might match patients who would or would not respond to, to uh, treatments like immunotherapies to improve survival and the disease that is um, almost always fatal. So we've learned a lot about um, different processes and their associations by looking at these networks. Uh, we also published a paper last year using very similar methods looking at sexual dimorphism in cancer, comparing gene regulatory networks in males and females, and using it to understand why males and females have different responses to chemotherapy. So this paradigm is actually starting to play itself out. I'll tell you, we're still trying to build this into a regular, to predictive framework. But all of this tells us that there are some important lessons we have to keep in mind. The first is there are many types of networks. They all tell us different things. So I told you uh, I could tell you how not to do networks. All the networks that people put together, even Arachne networks or Viper networks, can give you insight depending on what questions you ask. The network structure, though, really matters. And when you look at a network, you need to understand what the edges are telling you and what the structure is telling you. Changes in the network structure can help identify drivers of disease and identify therapeutic targets. And if we analyze the networks carefully, we can gain insight into the biology of the system we're studying. So I didn't do too badly.
Um, I opened with a quote from George Box. I'm going to close with one of my favorite quotes. It's overused by me, but it's my favorite of all time. This is from Enrico Fermi. My PhD was in physics. Fermi is, of course, a famous Nobel Prize winning physicist. Fermi said, before I came here, I was confused about the subject. After listening to your lecture, I'm still confused, but at a higher level. So I may have left you highly confused. I know there's a reception with pizza and beer afterwards, or some at least pizza. Um, and so I'd be happy to answer questions. I will tell you this is the work of a lot of really talented people. Um, you can find me on the internet if you want to send me an email. If you're in Boston, our group meeting is Tuesday morning at 9.30. Our group is a socialist collective. Anybody who wants to come can come. If you want to steal our ideas, good luck. Uh, <laughs> but you're more than welcome to come and visit any time. If you happen to be in Boston and want to just stop by and talk, let me know. If you want to come and hang out in our department and talk to people, um, I'm more than willing to try to host you. But thank you very much for hosting me in Toronto. It's always a pleasure to come here and visit Ben, as well as my friends, and uh, <laughs> so many people. I love Toronto, so many people live here. But anyway, thank you very much for having me.